Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse, and we're in chapter 8. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for that access that we've been given to boldly approach the throne of grace and for help in time of need. We are so aware of our limitations and just how little we know. We're so grateful and thankful that, that we have you as our teacher, that you instruct us, that you guide us, that you comfort us. I just want to ask you to filter out all of that which is not of you, which is foolish, which is ignorant, which is not of the truth. Strike out, filter out all of that which is not of you, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and truth alone. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Chapter 8's been a very interesting uh, chapter in the sense that, you know, prior to this we looked at relationships between husbands and wives, relationships between uh, parent, uh, parents and children, relationships between uh, fathers and their virgin daughters. We've looked at uh, relationships and, and how that they uh, uh, are to be viewed in light of the, the new covenant of grace that we live under and now we're looking at basically relationships in general I believe with our brothers and our sisters in Christ in our last study together we had reached the the area of verses 9 and 10 uh, I believe of chapter 8 and as we go through this uh, section by section and, and hopefully verse by verse we you know, I don't. I know I don't always do that, but as we go through this and we look at this, uh, the uh, the eighth chapter it started another consideration of some of the questions at Corinth. Uh, you know, they had received a message that they were to abstain from food that had been offered to idols uh, and from uh, idol worship and uh, the eating of blood. Uh, and there were questions that arose uh, within the body of Christ there. There were, there were questions that arose over this matter. And so we were introduced uh, uh, in the chapter to the fact that we are, in fact, uh, we are God's children. God has a family, and we're His children. And we're brothers and we're sisters in Christ. Just like an earthly family has a family with weaker and stronger members, uh, God's family is no different. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. He knew us before we knew Him. Uh, it's astounding how that the, the biblical truth of God foreknowing us and, and choosing us, uh, you know, you did not choose me, uh, but I chose you, he says. Uh, you know, what, what anger that that seems to cause uh, and dissension and division that it seems to cause among many people who profess to know and love the Lord, who profess to be Christian. They uh, prefer to believe that it is what they do uh, not what God did, but uh, Scripture is very clear. Uh, perfect, passive, if you're looking at the grammar, God did it completely in past time with the results continuing on into the future uh, or into the present. Uh, and we're looking at the present reality that it, it is God it is He who foreknew us, not us who foreknew Him. And 
he called us so that we are or he called us because we are his children one family in Christ uh, this is a very sensitive chapter I, it, it, it may seem uh, uh, somewhat boring to some uh, of individuals but I, I I think we would have to spend a whole lot of time here in order to really glean uh, everything from the text that, that I think is relevant. Uh, there's, uh, there's no doubt that there's evidence of Christian love, but, uh, but there's, there's clearly an anger toward the doctrine of election. And there are great differences among Christians. And it, it almost uh, comes to a point of hostility sometimes. Uh, I mean, I, I've had Christians who wanted to hurt me, who wanted to hit me because, you know, I said that God was sovereign. Now, you may not have experienced that in, in, your, in your walk and in your, your life with the Lord, but I have and I, and I know others who have. Uh, I didn't say that he was sovereign. God himself said that he was sovereign. Our chapter started out that he foreknew us, that we're his. This is how the, cha the chapter started. When we deal with other Christians, we're dealing with uh, not only brothers and sisters, but with those for whom Christ died. He loved them every bit as much as He loved uh, us or, or any one of us. He died in their place, a substitutionary death. He died for them. They're His children. We are God's children. Whether we're strong, whether we're weak, we're still God's children. If you had younger children in a family, I'm sure that you would you know, more immature children or younger children, I'm sure that you'd have the same concern for them, and so does God here. That's my point. There is children, and our concern for them ought to be the same as His concern for them. That's my point. I think that's the, the, the point here of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So we are a family together, and we had the point in our last chapter about suing another brother. We're, you know, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not to, to, to go before the world, the, the court, to sue our brother, brothers and sisters to settle matters that could be settled, uh, sh that should be settled among us in the body of Christ. And then we were told that there are idols all over the place. There are those that are called gods, but there's only one God and one Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like such an obvious truth to, to most of us. I mean, you know, we, we, we tend to look at, read, you know, read those words or we, we tend to speak those words and, you know, there's only one God. Uh, but uh, I wonder just how much the truth of that really has seeped down into our soul. We have... God, the Father, by whom are all things, and the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, by the Father, through the Son, okay, whom are all things, one God, three persons. That's, that's what really exists, not all of these idols, these, uh, you know, made of stone or made of whatever, whatever they're made of. But every man doesn't have that knowledge. Every man does not have that knowledge because for some with with conscience of of the idol unto unto this hour they eat at this as a thing offered unto an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled their conscience that's the de definition basically of strong and weak now i don't see how that that definition cannot include doctrine. You know, when we talk about weaker brothers, uh, 
the stronger brother versus the weaker brother. I think doctrine has some plays some relative part in that. Um, I'm, I'm fairly convinced of that. I'm absolutely opposed to the idea that if you're not an expert in Greek or Greek grammar or Hebrew or or I don't know whatever else uh, that that you don't you know if you're not an expert in homiletics or hermeneutics or anything you know that you don't know what this book means. I think God has written in rather simple language uh, that which we can understand and believe. But we also, at the same time, we also know that doctrine saves us. O Timothy, give heed unto doctrine, for in doing so you shall save both thyself and them that hear thee. That is delivered. Okay? Uh, doctrine delivers us. The weak person, I believe, is one who has a weak conscience. Uh, the strong person is the one, you know, who, who has a strong conscience. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can argue, I suppose, uh, about uh, how much doctrine has to do with that, but the fact that one is strong in biblical doctrine does not necessarily mean that he isn't weak in conscience. This letter that uh, the apostles wrote from Jerusalem to the Gentiles. You know, uh, we wouldn't put any other constraint on you. Okay? The text says. We wouldn't do that. We're not, we are not putting any laws, rules, regulations, constraints, uh, demands on you. We only write that you abstain from food offered idols. Now, that's a giant leap, okay, from what most Christians today, I believe, in, especially today, uh, it's in, in how that they relate to one another in the body of Christ. Many constraints are placed upon others. Abstain from food offered idols. Verse 8 tells us that meat has absolutely nothing to do with our standing before God. That's what that verse says. You know, whether we eat meat, we're not better. I mean, whether we don't eat meat, we're not worse. You know, or vice versa. has nothing to do at all with our standing before God, our position before God in Christ. I'm told by the Holy Spirit that what I eat ab has absolutely nothing to do with my standing before God. Okay? Now that, that is a strong statement. A very strong statement. It's absolutely contrary to what the Corinthians, the, the believers there uh, at the church at Corinth, felt. However, take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block, that is a, a snare, a trap to them that are weak. Now, and you know, I'm always afraid of, of not doing a very good job of explaining what I'm even thinking. I'm kind of famous for that, but uh, now the weakness is their conscience, says the text, okay? It's not the faith, it's the, their conscience. 
not the fact that they don't have the same strong biblical doctrine that you do or the same faith that you do, uh, even though, you know, our faiths, our faith differs. You know, we've each been given a measure of faith. Uh, conscience is, is interesting. It really is. We can have some arguments with, you know, I guess with those who uh, uh, profess to know more, but uh, a human being is the only one that has a, a God-given conscience. Okay? I mean, even the non-believer, you know, uh, has a conscience. Their conscience also bearing them witness. Okay? The non-believer. Uh, animals, they, well, they don't have a conscience. Uh, horses, uh, they, they ain't got much of a brain. I mean, the size of a walnut, you know, it's amazing that, that uh, it seems like this horse that I have now, that in all the time that horses have evolved, you know, he'd be stronger than a, a, a mop stick. But, you know, I, he doesn't have much of a brain. He doesn't have much of a conscience. They have consciousness but they don't have a conscience I mean it it doesn't bother it never bothers a monkey if he grabs the other monkey's banana because he doesn't have a conscience okay but you do you do now you may have a defiled conscience okay you uh, you may have a conscience that you've abused. But every human being, everyone who's ever lived, has a conscience. Even nations have a conscience, okay? And, and we're apparently, uh, you know, here in the U.S., we apparently or we're changing the consciousness of this country or we have ha have for a long time I think I've pointed this out before in no way 400 years ago could you have ever suggested that marriage includes two men or two women okay uh, in fact, it violates the dictionary definition. And uh, if, if anyone had suggested that it would become legal, people, I don't think, I don't think people would have believed it. And yet there is a... Uh, there is a consciousness among many people that this can't be right. And, and God is saying there are some who have a weak conscience and some who have a strong conscience. And since we are related to one another, we're members of God's family, one family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're members of God's family. Uh, since we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to respect that. And there's a lot of scripture. Okay, there is this amazing a lot of scripture on conscience. There's more the more more scripture on conscience than I ever thought that there was. There, just uh, look at it. There's a there's a lot of scripture on the subject of a person's conscience. Okay, let me just read a few verses on that, and uh, and we'll go on. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out uh, one by one. Now you all know that when they brought the woman taken uh, in adultery to accuse her before Christ, they were convicted by their own conscience. You know, these were uh, people who uh, were opposed to Christ. They're the, the same class of people uh, of, of whom he said, ye are of your father the devil. And, uh, and here, you know, do I exercise myself to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men? 
Uh, clearly, the Holy Spirit has Paul declare that his conscience was part of his everyday life. Uh, Romans chapter 2, we see uh, conscience mentioned again. Uh, to the believer, to the Gentiles, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing them witness. Uh, so God put it there. Romans chapter 9, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 13, uh, many of you may remember this from when we went through Romans, wherefore you must need to be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we've had our own conversation in the world. 1 Timothy 1, holding faith in a good conscience, which uh, having put away concerning the faith, many uh, have made shipwreck. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, 1, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have made remembrance of you. Hebrews 9, gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. How much more, listen, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9, 14. Now that's a strong, strong verse. Was the purging, folks, of your conscience regarding sin, was it sufficient? I mean, many, many Christians apparently don't think so. The Holy Spirit says that Christ offered himself without spot to God. Now, we can talk about what he did for you on the cross, okay? But he offered himself spotlessly to God in order to purge your conscience from dead works to serve Him, to serve the living God. Dead works, because nothing, nothing, nothing you could ever do for God could equal what Christ did for you, okay? If you really understand that, you have no more conscience of sin. And I talk to Christians all the time whose entire focus is on sin, not just in themselves, but in others. Okay? They just can't get away from remembering that, that bad thing that happened to them that they did years ago. Folks, why is it so much easier to think that we've committed a sin that can't possibly be handled when God says that Jesus Christ died once for sin, not just your sin, but all sin? If what Christ did in offering Himself to God was insufficient, folks, then we don't have any hope. We have no hope. Blessed hope forever, no hope. Okay? We ought to have no more conscience of sin. That isn't saying that you don't sin. But you say what God said, Christ paid it all. The reason that you have no conscious guilt of, before God in, in regard to the sin matter is because Christ took that guilt. Every sin that you ever committed was future when Christ died. But He's not going to die again. He offered Himself only once. First Peter, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. If you feel guilty for some sin in your life, then Christ didn't do enough. As far as your, your thinking goes, okay? The Almighty, Eternal God, who in, 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 in our, our very chapter was who the, the Creator of all things. When He says your sins have been forgiven, they're forgiven. 1 Peter 3, 
the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we died with Him, we were buried with Him, and we rose with Him. It's the answer of a good conscience. Okay? But make sure this liberty of yours doesn't become a snare, a trap to a brother or a sister in Christ who has a weak conscience. Clearly, folks, the 10th verse says, this is, this is open and apparent to anybody who sees you. Okay. Clearly, our text is saying, and, and other, I believe other truth confirms, that all of these who are weak are by, by God's design, yet almost everybody that comes to this text says, now what we ought to do is we, ought, we need to strengthen these weak brothers. It doesn't say that. The, the general opinion is that these people don't know enough, man, they're, and they're just kind of dumb. You know, we're smart. They're dumb. You know, if, if we taught them more doctrine, if we gave them more insight, well, you know, if we just did this, that, or the other thing, they wouldn't have this weak conscience. Their conscience wouldn't be so weak. The reason that they have this conscience, which this text says is weak, is because God put it there. Okay? You didn't put your conscience that there, where, wherever it's at, okay? God did. God says in this chapter, no man knows anything yet as he ought to know. None of us, none of us know anything yet as we ought to know. And, and through my knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Knowledge puffs up, folks, makes, makes you proud, okay? That 11th verse ought to be the subject of the whole video. I'm going to brush over it quickly so that we can go on with, with chapter 9. But shall the weak brother be ruined for whom Christ died? This is a brother for whom Christ died. This is your brother in Christ. Okay, Christ died in his place. Now, if, you've got, if you happen to be an Arminian, all right, you're thrilled okay, with this verse. You know, clearly, here is one for whom Christ died who can go to hell... And, and, he, he, and, you, and you do that by saying perish means go to hell. Amazing what we do with words. You know, we do that with uh, saved as though saved means born again. It doesn't. It means rescued. It means delivered. You may be delivered. You may not be delivered. But whether or not you're born from above is totally up to God and nothing to do with you. It doesn't have anything to do with you. And we treat words lightly. You know, I hear all the time, well, the minute that you accept Christ, that instant, that very instant, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But to say that, you have to change the obvious and open meanings of words. And I don't want to do that. I can't do that. The word perish is a word that means to be ruined, to be destroyed. Can a Christian be can your brother or sister in Christ be destroyed? Can you destroy them? Yes, you can. God says through your knowledge, a weak brother can be ruined for whom Christ died. You know, I read Romans chapter 14 in a, in a, a, a previous video. Hast thou faith, have it to thyself before God. Blessed is he that condemns not himself in that which he allows. That's his conscience. But he that doubts is condemned if he eats because he doesn't eat of faith and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. A conscience ruined. Not a soul destroyed. Not sent to hell. You know, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. It can't mean that they're going to perish. That they're going to go to hell. That I've sent them to hell somehow. I've sent my brother to hell. That's just ridiculous. Can they be ruined? I think so. I have to think so because the text says so. In fact, it says exactly what Romans 14 says. Don't ruin your brother for whom Christ died. When you sin against the brethren and you wound their weak conscience, that's, that's 
the word perish, you sin against Christ. Therefore, I don't want to sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother, there are so many Christians who look at others and, and, and never even think that that's, well, you know, that's my brother. It's, it, no, it's some idiot that has this strange biblical doctrine. It, it's, no, he's your brother. I may think he's nuts, okay, but I love him. I love him in the Lord. I wouldn't want to sin against Him. I wouldn't want to sin against Christ. I will tell them what I think the Scriptures say. There is no food or anything that compares to the goodness, to the help, to the benefit of one of my brothers. You know, a case in point would be, uh, and, and I always, I've always hated mentioning names, but that Los Angeles-based preacher, Dr. Gene Scott, many of you know who I'm talking about. You know, they were, uh, he, he broadcast in something like over 180 countries. He, he was a un, very unusual uh, uh, televangelist who smoked cigars. He wore odd headgear and he used profanity. Uh, he didn't much seem to care who he offended, okay? Uh, I, I expect he believed that he was free in Christ to uh, exercise the freedom that he had in Christ. And if you didn't, then you were, you were an idiot. Okay, but he was going to flaunt that. He was going to put that right up front and show you, well, I'm different than everybody else. I don't believe in all that no nonsense, all that garbage that everybody else does. I know that we've been forgiven of all our sin. I know that my conscience has been purged of all sin. Uh, that I don't have. There's no room in my life, my walk, my relationship with the Lord for a guilty conscience. God would not have me, 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 me have that, do that. I'm, I'm, I'm free in Christ. You know, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free indeed. Okay, I mean, you know, you, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I mean, you know, you have freedom in Christ. You're not under any law. You're not under any dictates, any, any, anything that would, that would uh, hinder that, that lovely freedom that you have in Christ so you can do all things. You have faith to eat all things. You have faith to do all things, to say all things, to think all things. You're not under law. There are no restrictions. There's no condemnation. You're free. You're free. And your brother doesn't believe that. And your brother is an idiot. And he ought to believe like you. He ought to do, act like you, think like you, believe like you. We've all been given a measure of faith, dearly beloved. You didn't muster up that faith on your own. You're only where you're at because God decreed, determined, will that you be. Okay? He's either working in you both the will and do of His good pleasure, or He lied. And if He's working in you both the will and do of His good pleasure, is He not working in your brother both the will and do of His good pleasure. Are you your brother's keeper? Are, who are you to determine how much faith you think your brother ought to have? Well, you know, if he just had the faith that I had. Dearly beloved, this is your brother or sister, in Christ, for whom Christ died. If you can't see the heart in this chapter that God has for the weaker brother, I'm not going to any. I, I will never would never suggest that God loves the weaker brother more than the stronger brother. Okay, I would be wrong to do that. But you've got to see the heart that God has for your weaker brother. And yet, how do we act? How do we respond to that weaker brother? I can tell you, in the main, that's not typically... We don't typically react, respond, relate to our weaker brother in the way that God would have us relate. Okay? Oh, no. Not even close. Okay? No, we, we, we tend, we bite and, bite and devour one another. We, we put each other under law. We, we have expectations of one another. I have mentioned this more on more than one occasion. 
no expectations, no disappointment. That, that is true. That, that comes in. That's a handy little saying that works quite well, fits right well into your marriage, into your relationship with your boss, your children, your marriage, and one another in Christ. No expectations. No disappointment. I would say you could even carry that over as far as into your relationship with God Himself. Do I have any expectations of God? Well, not none other than what He said that, that He would do. But do I have any expectations of my brother and sisters in Christ? Unjustified, undue expectations. How is it that I cause a brother to stumble? How is it that I cause that brother, that I, I come to sin against Christ in wounding that brother's conscience? Because he doesn't have faith to eat all things as I do. I don't think that freedom is something to be flaunted. Okay? Or uh, like in the case of Dr. Gene Scott, I mean, really flaunt it just in your face, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just buck the entire system, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna really show you what it's like to to be free in Christ, okay? And and I'm not gonna argue with, I wouldn't, I would have never argued with Dr. Gene Scott about as, as far as smoking. You know, cigars, well, is smoking cigars a sin, you know, or, you know, is using a little profanity, you know, is that, is that, is that, is that sin? I mean, I, whatsoever is not of faith, folks, is sin, all right? And here's your brother, the weaker brother, the one for whom Christ died. He doesn't have the faith that you have. Are you going to act toward him in a way that, that leaves him with the impression that he ought to have the, the faith that you have? And, if, and, if, and he's an idiot for not okay, believing as you do or exercising the faith that you do. Isn't it about love, folks? Isn't it? I mean, this is God's family we're talking about. If you, if, you, if you are a family man and you have a family, a wife and children, and you have a family, or if you have had a family, you are, I'm sure you are quite well aware of the fact that in, within that family, you are going to have children. Some are going to be stronger. Some are going to be weaker. And so... How would you as a parent react to the weaker? Well, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. We're going to move into chapter 9 uh, in our next video. I'm looking forward to September because September, it seems to me like, is going to, to uh, really tell us a lot about where we're at on the prophetic time timetable of everything. And I'm also, uh, I also haven't given up on summer. Uh, this is, I believe, the, at the, the time of the date of the recording of this video. This is the first day of summer. I wish everyone a blessed summer. Uh, enjoy your summer. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.